That's it. Hallelujah. Come on, lay it down for us. Come on. That's it. Hallelujah. Oh God. And our God reigns. Woo! Jesus. And hallelujah. Oh, we lift your name, God. Woo! And hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, you reign. And hallelujah. Come on, lovers of God. Come on, lovers. Lovers of God. That's who you are. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. Oh, we love you, Jesus. And hallelujah. Oh, we lift your name, God. Hallelujah. How God reigns, He reigns, He reigns, Hallelujah! Oh, we lift Your name, God, Hallelujah! You reign, You reign, Hallelujah! Our God reigns. you love him right now go ahead and tell him lift it up draw it up lord draw it out of our hearts right into the heavens like incense rising let it rise right into your heart lord breathe in our praises drink in our adoration and our love we love you abba oh father oh father you are wonderful and we love you father he reigns you always do what's right. You never make a mistake. You know what you're doing, Father. And we love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. How God God sits securely on his throne. He is in charge of it all, the entire world, and he knows what he's doing. Let's just give him a clap offering. Thank you, Lord. You know what you're doing, Lord. Thank you that you're in charge. You're secure, Lord Jesus. You're securely on your throne. We thank you that you reign above all, Lord, above all the earth, Lord Jesus. You reign above our lives, Father. You care for us, Lord Jesus. There's nothing that's too hard for you, Lord Jesus. Every difficulty you have overcome, Lord Jesus. You have seen us through, Lord. Even before we see it, Lord, you have seen us through, Lord. You're pushing us on through. And we thank you that you aren't worried, Lord Jesus. You're in charge of it all. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Before you sit down. You are on a mission tonight to bless somebody that's near you. You've already hugged and kissed and hello and all that stuff. You're going to blast them. You're going to pray over them. You're going to, listen, what I'm going to share with you tonight, oh my, something's going to blow here in this house. Something's going to explode. We need it. New England needs it. This church needs it. Don't look now. You need it. So pray for the person next to you, even if you don't like them and say, Lord, fill them, bless them, prepare them for what they're going to hear tonight. Ready, set, pray. Bless the world. Awesome. 
Bless them, God. We pray for Pastor Glenn and Denise, Lord. We thank you for their lives. We pray for our beautiful pastors here in this house, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for the shepherds that watch over the flock. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those watching online tonight. We pray blessing and favor the kiss of heaven upon their hearts. Let the outpouring of the Holy Spirit come upon everyone watching online and in this sanctuary tonight. Thank you, God. Oh, Jesus. My, my, my. Oh, is there anybody here that loves Jesus? Is there anybody here that loves the Holy Spirit? I love you, Holy Spirit. Go ahead and say it. Jesus won't get jealous. I love you, Holy Spirit. Go ahead and say that. I love you, Holy Spirit. I love all of you, Holy Spirit. I love your mysteries. I love the revelation you bring me and the wind that blows upon me. Yeah, go ahead and have a seat for now. You're actually going to be doing a lot of up and down tonight because I'm going to pray over you seven times. I'm here tonight on a mission from God. I'm going to share with you about the seven anointings, the seven mantles, the seven spirits of God, the seven torches, the seven horns, the seven eyes of the Lamb are the seven spirits sent out into all the earth. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm quoting from the book of Revelation. Three times in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 4, 1, 4, and 5, three times in the book of Revelation, it speaks of the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God are one spirit. The number seven is the number of fullness, completion. It's the number of all God can reveal and give to you. Seven is a really good number. I want the mark of 777 seven, seven on me, baby. The seven spirits of God, I'm not bringing some strange teaching. This is throughout the scriptures. I'm going to point you to Isaiah 11. If you want a head start, you could turn there. Isaiah 11, verse 1, real quick. But the, the scriptures clearly teach us that if God is three in one, it's okay for the Holy Spirit to be seven in one. We have one God who is revealed in three expressions and one spirit that bonds our hearts as one in the body of Christ. And that one spirit is revealed with seven flames, seven branches on the lampstand, seven torches burning on the sea of glass, seven eyes of the Lamb. The eyes of God sent out into all the earth, the seven spirits of the Lord, the full revelation of God. God is all-knowing. He knows stuff you don't know. I know that's hard to believe. But I'm going to request that everybody leave your know-it-all badge at the door tonight. To leave that know-it-all mentality. You know, that's what caused the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the hope they seize. It's what caused them to, to miss their appearing, God's appearing among men because they felt like they already knew it. You know, the amazing thing about Jesus, when he taught on the earth, nobody figured out what he meant. He would teach his disciples. Everybody would say yes. They'd even take notes. And they'd go out the door after he taught them. And they were smiling. It was so good. But they didn't have a clue what he said. And the disciples, his very own, the 12 that walked with him, they constantly came to him and said, what? Huh? Tell us about the parable of the sower. Tell us about these mysteries of the kingdom. Matthew 13, 11 says that to you have been given the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And all those mysteries are unveiled only by the Spirit of the Lord within us. So this Holy Spirit within us is going to bring the church to full maturity. The seven spirits of God are needed to go into all the, the, um, all the corners of our hearts and of our lives to bring us to full maturity in Christ. So what I'm going to unveil to you tonight 
are the seven anointings that, that God is giving His last day's church. With these, the church will be equipped. Without them, we operate with nothing but religion. The Holy Spirit has to be the secret and the, the, the key to the revelation mysteries of heaven. We must be a people in Connecticut and New York. We must be a people who lay down our supposed intellectual pride that presumes we know more than we do. The exaggerated sense of our spirituality. We lay it down to the dust and we say, God, I'm nothing but a child. Teach me. He says, at last, I have you where I want you. And I'll begin to teach you the secrets, the mysteries, the parables, the allegories, the metaphors, the revelation of the word of God. But I'm telling you, the know-it-all mentality, that, that sense that you've already, you've already heard this, you already know this, that you, you, you've been Bible college. Woo! I'm telling you, I have memorized half the New Testament. For 42 years, I've laid my life down with very little intermission to do nothing but to discover the grace kiss and the, the revelation truth of God. And the more I get into this, the dumber I get. I know less now than I once did. And we hold, we're in love with our opinions instead of Jesus. And we, we, we actually transfer our opinions and our traditions and our dogmas. And we say, that's the truth. Oh, yeah? I used to teach this Holy Spirit stuff was of the devil. I'm a recovering Baptist and, and coming out of the closet. But I'm telling you, I, I used to teach all of you crazy, crazy Maddox, cruise Maddox, that you were missing God until Angel visited me in the jungle, stood right in front of me and opened my spirit in one instant in the middle of the night and said, I want you to go to another village and I want you to give this message to this one person. And I did it and I discovered as the power of God landed on him within three seconds of me shaking his hand, the power of God came upon him. And this is pre-Toronto, baby. He was on the floor like bacon in a frying pan, just shaking in a bacon. And he converted on the spot. Three weeks later, he was killed in the jungle. A tree fell on him. When he was chopping down trees, he was killed. And I knew now. The devil isn't going to send me a fiery burning man to tell me to go and win somebody to Jesus. The devil is not going to do that. And that began my journey out of this evangelicalism, know-it-all. I've already got these things figured out. I can give you the seven dispensations. I know the charts. To where I don't know anything. You're going to have to teach me. And he began to give me, my wife and I dreams and visions. And to this day, she still dreams four dreams every night. It's unbelievable. The dream machine. I married a, a dream come true. I told you all last night when God created Adam and Eve, he looked at Eve and he said, I can do better than that. And then he made Candace not too many years ago. God showed off when he made her. I'm telling you, she's amazing. Best wife I've ever had. But my wife and I have been on this journey of, of, of Song Yong Nim, Holy Spirit, Espiritu Santo. To, to discover the realm of authentic, true revelation of the Holy Spirit that is verified by Scripture, that is even uh, many times, if not all the time, it's reinforced through church history. But it's been sanitized, filtered out by a religious system called churchianity that has room for everything except Holy Spirit at times. So I'm so thankful, worship team, that you let, let me kind of get a little rowdy here tonight and go with this. Because the more freedom you go into these things, the more you're going to experience the fresh, raw. I'm telling you, guys, until we have love feasts, until we get into that realm of koinonia, fellowship, so intense, the unbelievers come into the building and say, my God, you're here. You're revealing the secrets of my heart, tongues and interpretations, prophecies. Revelation of God is being unveiled. We are not a natural people anymore. Go to the Lions Club, the, you know, the Rotary. I mean, I don't know. This is not that. 
We are a spirit-filled people. And my Father sent me here this week to help keep and to release something about the fire of God. I'm going to get to my seven anointings here in a second. It's Friday night. You can, hang, you can handle it. But I remember teaching for years that tongues was of the devil. And I started getting dreams, prophecy, visions. I'll never forget the first vision I had praying. And then it started coming more and more until finally I went through a 10-day period of almost constant open visions and then dreams every night. It was like unbelievable as I got introduced to the prophetic anointing. But I didn't speak in tongues. I said, God, this is the strangest thing. How come, how come you haven't let me speak in tongues? He said to me, how long have you taught that tongues was of the devil? He said, that's how long you're going to wait until you get the gift of tongues. <laughs> There's something about the Holy Spirit. There's something about his gifts that God is very, very, very jealous of. And when he's been poured out upon us, he doesn't give those gifts as merit badges or trophies to the super elite. He gives these gifts liberally. He gives it generously, extravagantly. He's the prodigal giver, as we shared last night, the prodigal father. He pours it out upon us. So I want more. So do you want to be taught tonight some things maybe you've never heard? Is that okay? You can check me out. I like that when you check me out because you'll grow and you'll learn in that. You'll discover your own journey as you get into the scriptures. And, and as a Berean, you search to see if what the things I'm teaching you are really true or not. So I don't have any insecurity about that. It makes me a better speaker and a better person and a better man when I'm challenged to prove those things. So I, I'm, I'm cool with that. But I'm telling you, folks, the seven spirits of God are ready to be poured out into Connecticut. And the tragedy that struck our state not too many months ago, God is going to reverse the curse and he's going to bring a waterfall of souls. Salvations are going to visit high schools as we kick in this fall and middle schools and grammar schools and universities and colleges of, uh, of Connecticut, including Yale University. God is going to target these very epicenters of intellectual knowledge and he's going to pour out the spirit of revelation, the greatest mission field of the world is the college campus. And I believe he's going to capture a generation. Too hot to handle young people are coming to a church near you. God's going to grip them with a vice grip of his love and his fire. Now, the seven spirits of God. I'll do this real quick, but I just want to drop this on you. The seven spirits are like seven branches of the lampstand. Let's read Isaiah 11 verse 1, it says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. The shoot means a sprout, a twig, a, a tiny branch, something that signifies new life is going to come from what was once cut off. This was the Davidic kingdom cut off by the uh, division of, the, of Israel and the, the uh, apostasy that came into the land and the eventual, uh, the eventual uh, captivity uh, that happened twice to Israel. But out of that cut off stump of Jesse. Now Jesse is the father of who? He's David's papa. The cut off stump of Jesse is a, a metaphor of the cut off promises that had not yet been fulfilled. God says, I'm going to fulfill. I'm going to have somebody sit on David's throne. But David's throne was vacant. So that cut off promise, there's a sprout coming up. Now this is the word uh, for branch. This is the word natser, or branch. Everybody say, the branch of the Lord. And from his roots, this branch, there it is, natser, that's where we get the Hebrew words natser, that's where we get Nazareth, Nazarene, uh, Nazarite. It all comes from natser, the word that is for branch. On the cross of Jesus Christ, when it said Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, that word natser was right there on the, the uh Placard, the sign over the head of Jesus on his cross. So this is Christ coming forth. He's going to branch out through you and I, and he's going to bear fruit. Now, the branch of the Lord in today's uh, moment, in this moment, the branch of the Lord is Christ in us. I am the vine. You are the branches. He has branched out through us. 
He is the sprout that as he grew up, he branched out through all the believers, the faithful ones that remain, abide, connect in life union with him. We are operating in the spirit life of Jesus. Jesus had the seven spirits without measure. He was so anointed, my friend. He knew the thoughts of men. He knew what man had hidden in his heart. Nobody needed to tell him what was in man. He knew because he saw the Father every day. He saw what the father was doing Jesus many times entered into the spirit realm while he was walking with his disciples and he could see the father with open vision he had a relationship with God so full and complete that he constantly had endless revelation that he could implement and apply to his ministry he knew the person, like the woman at the well. He knew he had to go through Samaria because there was a, a chick there he had to lead to Jesus, uh, lead to him. And, you know, that's right. He, he had to lead her to him. Uh, he was a good evangelist. So he had this endless supply of revelation. Would you like to have that? That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a drop, uh, not a word of knowledge. How about the spirit of knowledge? If the spirit of knowledge is on you, it's like a river that flows. It's not like, oh, I get a word of knowledge. I think perhaps somebody has a, a, a bad toenail. Well, probably. But how about the spirit like a river pouring through you all the time of revelation knowledge when you shake somebody's hand. You know the grief they've just gone through and you can minister to them with the revelation words of comfort that he gives to you. See, we look into each other's eyes and we see the Jesus coming forth in them and we take them the next step with the revelation we unveil to them. The full mature sons and daughters are going to come on the earth and they're going to have the seven spirits without measure just like Jesus had that anointing without measure. The anointed Jesus lives in me. You know Christ means the anointed one, right? The name Christ is the anointed one. Antichrist would be anti the anointing. I'll let you do the math on that one. Now, this sprout is going to be a branch through us, and then it lists these seven spirits. I'm going to get to them quickly, but, but I want to touch this uh, before, uh, before it gets midnight. The seven branches are the lampstand. The lampstand was the burning bush. Moses captured the revelation of the burning bush, and he memorialized it in the tabernacle, and then Solomon in the temple. This is not a menorah. It's not nine branches. It's seven branches. The seven spirits of God. The lampstand is one beaten piece of gold. Jesus was a beaten piece of gold. And out of that beautiful work, the beaten work of Jesus Christ, we now are the branches upon that vine. Now, the hollow branch, central shaft, was hollow, and the oil was poured only into one branch. And then it went to the other six, three on each side. Jesus is the anointed one. You do not have an anointing. You have the anointed one, and you get his anointing. Isn't that great? So the more we connect intimately with Jesus, the more his anointing comes through our lives to love, to minister, to serve, to lay our lives down, to know what we ought to do and how to do it with revelation wisdom. So the, 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 uh, I may have done this here before, but let me go over again. The, the seven branches, each branch had in the gold itself was engraved in gold fruit and it was fruit in its three stages of maturity fruit that is a bud then it blossoms and then the fruit itself takes the place of the blossom so the bud blossom fruit sequence was engraved into every branch on the lampstand you see we're a fruitful branch aren't we we're a tree that evergreen that's always bearing fruit for Jesus Christ now the six branches on the side, the central shaft we'll come back to in just a second. It's more important. But the six, three on each side, those branches making the lampstand with the bud blossom fruit sequence, each side branch had that sequentially three times. So bud blossom fruit times three. Three times three equals... Ushers, uh, start passing out Red Bull, please. <laughs> three times three equals nine. Nine fruit of the Spirit. You see, every one of us bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, don't we? Okay, if there's six branches, each has nine fruit. Six times nine equals? 
Man, you got to be smarter than a second grader here. <laughs> Six times nine equals, let's hear it. 54, very good. Okay, so we're up to 54 fruit on this lampstand. It's just like a, a, a bush on fire with fruit everywhere in gold, burning with oil and fragrance. <clears throat> now, the central shaft, it had the bud blossom fruit, but because it was taller and it was where the priest would put the olive oil, the sacred oil, into that central shaft, and it was designed in such a way that it would go through the other uh, branches, and then they would light it with wicks, etc. But the central shaft was bud blossom fruit times four. Three times four equals 12. 12 is the apostolic governmental anointing. Jesus Christ is the chief apostle. He's the government, the head of the church. He carries an anointing greater than your favorite guru. More than, I know it's hard to believe, more than Candace. He carries that anointing. It's so powerful. Now, if you do the math and you do 54 side revelations of fruit and the 12 on the central shaft, you have 54 plus 12 equals 66 books of the Bible. Thy word is a lampstand under my feet and a light under my path. The Spirit and the Word, as they come together, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is always attached to the revelation of the Word. The more of the Word and the Spirit you get, the more the fullness of Christ is revealed. I believe the two witnesses of the last day will be the Spirit and the Word. You always are in error when you overemphasize over one or the other. And a lot of the, the charismatics, I'm telling you, bro, we need to get into the Word of God. We need to take Pastor Nick's uh, Bible's classes that are coming up. And, and uh, it, uh, who knows, I may come back and, and teach some of my goodies. But uh, we've got to get the Word of God in our heart. You need to memorize it, study it, devour it, eat it, like until it's fire in your bones, until it's honey dripping out of your lips. I'm telling you, we've got to be full of the Word of God. When people bump you, revelation of truth comes out of you. Instead of old, angry, critical stuff. Okay, so what we're reading in the seven branches, the seven spirits of God are these seven uh, branches of the lampstand. Now let's take them one by one and I'm going to pray over you. Ready? First of all is the Spirit of the Lord. You see it in verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Him. Who is the Him? Him is Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Him. The Spirit of the Lord. Everybody say the Spirit of the Lord. Now, the Spirit of the Lord is the manifest presence of God. It is the outbreaking. It's the, the, uh, the, the sensation of the anointing of the presence of God that was upon Jesus. And it radiated out from Him for a great distance. Thousands of people. For over three and a half years, He could not walk anywhere without a crowd pursuing Him. Multitudes. They would go without sleep. They'd go without food. They would, like, come out on a... Thursday night, because they were feeling and sensing the Spirit of the Lord. Now, the most uh, ancient translations, including the Chaldean and the Syriac translations of this verse, render it a little bit differently, and I believe they capture it even better. And it is the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon you was equivalent to prophetic utterance, the spirit of prophecy that came upon you. Ezekiel, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. Jeremiah, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. Even Saul, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he became another man. David, the Spirit of the Lord, he was not a prophet, he was a king. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he prophetically penned 75 of our Psalms. 74 to 75, depending on exactly how you, you split that. He wrote half of the Psalms. And in the book of Psalms translation I have out there, I list the authors of the book of Psalms for you. It's kind of interesting, a little interesting study. So the Spirit of the Lord, would you like to have the Spirit of the Lord upon you? Operating in your life, your hands when you pray over people, your mouth when you speak words. There's a, a piercing sound that goes into the hearts of people. There's a voice inside the voice that lingers long after our mouths shut. There's another voice that keeps on speaking inside the hearts of men. That's the Spirit of the Lord that's released through the breath of His servants. I want the Spirit of the Lord upon me. I want it. I needed it in the jungle when they wanted to kill me. I need it in Connecticut when they wanted to throw me out. I need it now 
when I translate the Word of God and I do the ministry He's called me to do, I want the Spirit of the Lord. Not just to do something, I want the Spirit of the Lord so that I can interact and be intimate and relational and a friend to the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to be my best friend. Like intimate lovers that the Spirit would, would breathe into me and as I exhaled, it becomes revelation to the people of God. When He exhales, I inhale. When I inhale... He exhales, or I exhale, He inhales, or however we should say that. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon me, I'll make sense. I want the Spirit of the Lord on me. I'm telling you, you get juiced, you get greased, you get oiled, you get attractive, you get anointed, you get favor, you get blessing. There's something that comes on you like a shield. It, it's, it's a... I'm telling you, it's better than anything Star Trek could put on you, bro. It's, it's, there's something powerful, alluring, attractive that comes upon you when you're anointed of God. I want the anointing. It teaches us of all things. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We don't need to filter it out with our religious grid and say, well, I only take what I can understand. Boy, you can't take much then, can you? You know, if you're only going to put God in your mind, that's a really small place to put Him. The door to truth is not the intellect. The door to truth is the spirit within you that opens and says, I will obey. I will follow. He says, all right, you'll be my son. You'll be my child, and I'll teach you. I'll take you by the hand and guide you with my eye. I will bring revelation to you like a morning kiss, like a fresh mercy manna kiss on your soul every single day. If you want the spirit of the Lord to come upon you, I want you to stand up right now in Jesus' name. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus... You have commissioned me and sent me here to release these seven anointings over this beautiful church. So I take the authority because of being sent by heaven, not in my name, but in the one who sent me, in the name of the one who called me and sent me here, ascended on high, in the mighty name of Jesus. You have purchased by blood the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You have given to us these seven anointings, these seven mantles. I pray in the name of Jesus now that you would release the Spirit of the Lord upon every heart, every mind, the weary one, the struggling one, the depressed one, the intellectual one, the analytical one. Short circuit every defense mechanism. Holy Spirit, wrap yourself upon them. Fall upon them now with your living presence. Lift your hands higher and just thank Him now. Just say, thank you, Lord. I'm coded. I'm anointed. I have received the Spirit of the Lord. The manifest presence of God is upon my life. I'm going to experience, I'm going to feel it, and other people are going to tell me. They feel the presence of the Lord upon me. And I pray that you teach me more, that you give me revelation, that I can reveal and release that anointing for five miles radius around me. That every person five miles from wherever I am will feel the manifest presence of God like a holy zone, like a, a cone, like a mushroom cloud of the glory realm of the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And with that anointing, Lord, all of your gifts will flow through my life as you see fit, Holy Spirit, to give as you direct me. Now thank Him right now. Just say, yes, God, I thank You. By faith, I thank You for that anointing. You can have a seat. The second is the spirit of wisdom. Now the spirit of wisdom is the judicial and governmental anointing. It is a divine grace given by the Spirit to implement wisdom among men. This is the anointing of skill, ability, and, and uh, cleverness in the business community. This is what every business person, man or woman, you work in an office, you interact in the business community, in the business realm, you need to have wisdom, you need to have skill. And uh, there is a, uh, a possible translation for this word wisdom that could be skill. It's the creative ability. It's what, 
is it Beziel, the guy who, I, I may be messing up his name, but he was the one that made the instruments of the tabernacle. He actually made the Ark of Covenant. He made the lampstand. He was a craftsman, and it says that the spirit of wisdom came upon him, and he had great skill to fabricate and create and make. This is an entrepreneurial anointing. It's where you become wiser than your boss. You become wiser than those in your office. You have a skill like Daniel. You have an anointing like Joseph. There's something wise that God has embedded into your spirit. And it may come through dreams. It may come through visions and even the hunch where you're at the right place at the right time. And God will operate through your life with this wisdom. Man, you need this wisdom. You need it with your family. You need it with your career. You need it with your community. We need it here in church life, in the body life of the body of Christ. So this spirit of wisdom. Now, this is one of the things Paul prayed for in Ephesians 1. If you remember the prayer, he asked that God would release the spirit of wisdom to the church at Ephesus. Fill them with the spirit of wisdom. The apostolic dimension operates in that anointing, in the spirit of wisdom. The church needs the wisdom of God. I have a very uh, high-level prophetic friend who told me that he said the greatest need of the last days is wisdom. Now, would you like to have a word of wisdom or the spirit of wisdom? You see, the spirit of wisdom is greater than that, that uh, gift that, that kicks in and at times may be dormant. This is why Paul told Timothy to stir up that gift. But when the spirit of wisdom is upon you, you are coded with a supernatural realm that brings success into your life. Let me just tell you straight because we're friends. If you had the spirit of wisdom flowing through your life, finances would never be a problem. There will be revenue streams, avenues to increase your financial impact. And wisdom, of course, means that you're generous. Read Proverbs, which, by the way, uh, will be out within about 10 days. Uh, it's being printed as I, well, not now, it's after, too late. But uh, I'm hoping by Tuesday or Wednesday, they should put it on a, they put the pallets on a truck and get it shipped to our warehouse. And within about 10 days or so, if you'll check our webpage, we'll be able to ship out the book of Proverbs to you. I gave a, an advance uh, peek to uh, Pastor Nick and uh, some of my other friends, Bill Johnson, is uh, just devouring it, absolutely loves it, just spoke last night about it down in Orlando in front of 10,000 people. And uh, uh, it's my good friend Johnny Enlow who wrote the um, forward, the endorsement for it. And I'm telling you, I, I honestly believe, I believe God gave me the key to the book of Proverbs. I, I know that sounds funny, but I'm not going to hide it. I believe God gave me the key to the book of Proverbs to unlock riddles, parables, dark speech, dark sayings, the Proverbs of the wisest man on the earth. He came, the Lord spoke to me one time and he said, do you think if the wisest man I ever put upon the earth wrote a book, Proverbs, that it would have more in it than you think? And that put me on a quest. To say, absolutely. He embedded some secrets. There's some things in there that only the spirit of wisdom can unlock. And the immature, the foolish one, which is referred to throughout the book of Proverbs, the foolish one, it's a closed book. Proverbs is just a, a boring do's and don'ts, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. But to the illumined heart, to the one drenched with the spirit of wisdom, I'm telling you, like Proverbs 31, I just ruined Mother's Day for like millions of Christians. Because the virtuous woman is not a woman. It's not a one woman thing. It's the last day's church. It's the radiant bride of Christ. And I've got about 30 footnotes in that one chapter to prove it. The word virtuous is a military, male, masculine, warrior word that is hardly ever translated virtuous. It should not have been translated that way. It is the word warring. It is a warring woman. Now, the church is always feminine. We're the bride of Christ. This radiant, warring woman, she works with her hands, fivefold ministry. She rises up at night, that's intercession, and she adopts a nation. You ought to read Proverbs 31 when the gift of wisdom comes upon your heart. I'm telling you, secrets that only come from above have been embedded into the Proverbs, and yet people will not even read it. And don't understand it and, and uh, just think it's boring. Oh, no, no, no. 
I really challenge you. Is that a good enough commercial? I really challenge you to get the Proverbs. The Spirit of the Lord came upon me. I told you I had a visitation from the one I love. He walked through my wall and breathed on me and released me to do this translation project. I wouldn't do it. I mean, I'm not stupid. Maybe I am to to do it. But, uh, I mean, this is crazy. 66 books, man. That's a lot of Bible verses. And I've already got people, like, slamming it. i got a whole web pages telling how I'm the devil, you know? Uh, they listed me as one of the most dangerous Christians in, our, in the prophetic, apostolic, spirit-filled movement right now. They listed me as one of the, one of the most dangerous because of this translation is going to change the church. I said, it takes my enemies to get it. My enemies are prophesying what's, what's going to happen. Now, we bless them. They're not my enemy in that regard. I'm not going to hurt them. They, they make me a better man. I even contacted one of them to put her blog out, and I said, you're making me a better man by, by your criticism. And she just, you know, she went ballistic and screamed and everything. <laughs> I don't care. Keep making me a better man. You know, it forces me into humility. It forces me, you know, into the Lord. And I'd be lying to tell you that I like it when people say bad things. I mean, come on. But it, pour, it it makes me become a person of the spirit and not of the mind of man. So the spirit of wisdom is what Jesus operated in. Not just a word of wisdom, a continual flow. The river that he says in John 7 will flow through you is a river with seven branches. It's the seven spirits, the seven rivers of God pouring through your dry, crusty heart. You really would be a better person if you had some wisdom. Can I tell you straight? You have made some real blunders in your life because you were not operating in the spirit of wisdom. Thank God for grace. It still reigns. There's a throne of grace. It triumphs over judgment. I mean, I'm a grace man totally to the bones. Thank God for a, a 50th chance, you know, not a second chance. You know, how many do we, a, a righteous man may fall, but God's going to get him back up again. So I'm telling you, we've made huge mistakes because we didn't operate in wisdom. But when wisdom enters our heart, it is sweet. It's the sweetest morsel. It's more than wealth. It means more than money. Let me tell you a secret. Your money has no value in the spirit realm. What money is on the earth, revelation is in the spirit realm. The currency of eternity is the revelation of the Holy Spirit. That by, when you see it, you buy the truth. You see the healing. You see the the miracle. That is the currency of God. It makes you wealthy. It's greater than rubies. It's greater than gemstones. Wisdom, seek it, look for it, ask for it. God will give it to everyone who asks when you ask in faith. I've been asking the spirit of wisdom to come upon my life for 42 years. Start now. It's happening. I'm going to keep asking every day. I pray the Ephesians 1 prayer over me and my family and the people I love. Get close to my wife and I, I'll probably pray it over you too. Would you like to have the spirit of wisdom on your life? Stand up like you really believe it. Okay. Come on, lift your hands up to God. God wants to anoint you. (laughs) Finances are going to break into your life like you've never seen before. Spirit of wisdom. (laughs) Spirit of wisdom all over you. (laughs) Oh, barostapa. Brostata, more spirit of wisdom in your hands, creativity. The Lord is going to give you creative ways to use these hands in the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, you have skills you haven't even tapped into. You have artistic, creative skills. You're going to be making things with your hands that will make money. More, 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 more wisdom and how to connect people in Jesus' name. Father, I pray by the authority of the ascended Christ that you would release now the spirit of wisdom upon your people. We blow off all of the introspection, all of the analytical thinking. And that you would come in the the way you want to come as the all-wise God. The God of all wisdom and knowledge. Baptize us in wisdom. Make our parenting out of the spirit of wisdom. Let our relationships be saturated with the spirit of wisdom. Let our use of finances and how we handle the resources you give us, give us the spirit of wisdom. There are people in this room that you're about to be given wisdom about your investments. God is going to multiply your investments. I'm telling you, He will supernaturally give you revelation to know what to do with your financial investments because He wants you 
to prosper, to be blessed. And your seed and your family as well. Spirit of wisdom, take a quick second. Put your hand on the shoulder of a person next to you and pray for them for the spirit of wisdom. And when you do that, wisdom is going to come upon you. More. Now the third, the third, I got to roll through this, is the spirit of understanding. You can have a seat. The spirit of understanding, the spirit of living understanding. You need to have the spirit of understanding. Not just to have an understanding heart, but the spirit of discernment and understanding that gives you revelation of, of, of people, situations, problems. You come up with solutions. You have creative ways to mend and heal because the spirit of understanding is upon you. Now, I don't know of any better way to describe it than the life of Jesus. He operated in this mantle. He exuded the spirit of understanding. He understood the hearts of people. The people you think are nothing but messes and failures. Jesus lifts them up from the dust. He sees a virtue in them no one else detected. And he knew that if he would anoint them and touch them, that that woman caught in adultery would change the world. And indeed she did. She became a great witness of Jesus. Everybody's ready to write her off. Everybody's saying, he's no good. She's no good. Look at the mess. Look at that person. Look how they messed up. Jesus said, they're just the ones I want. Because he understands the human heart. He understands the need. He understands that mercy always takes the heart closer to God than judgment and correction. We're quick to correct. We're quick to judge. We're premature judges. We have no right to be, to take that role. Our criticisms, you're all going to eat them one day. And some of the people you've criticized the most are going to rise up and bring blessing to you someday. And to your amazement, as you see the work of God prosper in their soul, they're going to turn around and advance beyond you because of that, that, that beam in your eye. See, the spirit of understanding can look at a, at a church and see the next step, can see the, the solution, can understand what needs to be done. It's a discerning spirit. And discernment is not always, I discern, I discern there's something wrong about you. Oh, really? You got a pencil, pencil and paper? Here, write these things down. I'll tell you what's wrong with me. You don't have to discern it. I'll just tell you. I mean, any one-eyed critic can tell you what's wrong. It's not going to help you. To be, to be told what's wrong doesn't help you. You need to be lifted up from what's wrong. You need to be brought out of darkness into light. You don't need to be told that darkness is all around you. You need a path to get out of that darkness. And the spirit of understanding unlocks that path in the human heart. There's something wise, and these anointings build, don't they? The spirit of prophecy, which operates with wisdom, which releases understanding. You see how these seven uh, steps, these seven rungs on a spiritual ladder, how they reveal more of God's heart as we go deeper. You need this. If you're married, you need this. If you're single, you need this. If you're a man, you really need this. If you're a woman, you need it too. If you're under 100, you need it. Every person in this room, on this side, you need it. On this side, you need it. The spirit of understanding. It creates love. It genders community. It genders fellowship when we operate in that. There's so many dimensions we could slice here with the spirit of understanding. I love the Song of Songs where it talks about his eyes are washed in milk by the water streams. They're mounted like jewels. And that tells us that his revelation of us, it's washed in nurturing love, the milk of a mother's heart. It's like his eyes are washed. When he looks through our mess, he sees something nobody else sees. It's washed with love. His eyes are like jewels by the water stream of revelation, the water flowing of understanding and revelation. So as he ministers to us, as he treats us and, and speaks to us, he does it like no other human being ever can do. Can you imagine if we had a, a church full of people like Jesus that began to minister to others the way he ministers to us? I'm telling you, you need the spirit of understanding. 
There's so much more. You're going to have to forgive me for leaving it off at this point, but I want you to stand up, and I want to release this spirit of understanding. And I, before I do, I want you to lay down and lay aside, I should say, lay aside your, your opinions, your, your uh, locked-in traditions that have done nothing but to put a lid on your heart and kept revelation and understanding from flowing through you. When the spirit of understanding comes into your heart, it, it, it goes beyond our opinions. You know, have you ever had an opinion about somebody and you were wrong? Let's be honest. Yeah, most of the time. You see, when we lock into these premature judgments and criticisms of people who are on a journey just like you are, we are showing that we are not operating in the spirit of understanding. I'm telling you, we'll become an attractive body of Christ, alluring to the lost and compelling to the believers when we operate with this anointing. So put your hand over your heart. And Father, I ask that through these hands, as we lay them upon our bodies, upon our hearts, Lord, you are in us in fullness, and we pray that your anointing of understanding, to give us an understanding heart, give us the spirit, the anointing, the mantle of understanding at work, at home, with our messed up family situation, the dysfunctional office, whatever is operating around us, that we have unusual insight and understanding that unlocks the hearts of the hardest of men. Give us that spirit. Everybody say it out of your mouth. Give me the spirit of understanding. Say it like you're desperate. Give me the spirit of understanding. Make me a different person. Go ahead and say it. Anoint me with this spirit of understanding. Now this is what Daniel had. Daniel 9.22. He says, uh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. Okay, have a seat. Let me give you the fourth one. The spirit of counsel. <clears throat> spirit of counsel. This is not so that you get a box of Kleenex, set up an office, and have everybody come and listen to you. The spirit of counsel is, uh, the word counsel is actually the word used for the steering wheel of a ship, the rudder, the, the steering mechanism, or the reins that you would hold in your hand of a chariot. So it is steering, and it's the, the strong guidance would probably be the best uh, translation, the spirit of strong guidance, would you not like to have upon you, upon your shoulders right now? When you turn to the right or you turn to the left, the spirit of understanding points you in the direction you're to go and say, yes, this is what you're to do with your life. This is the decision you're to make. This is the pathway that you're to take. Many of you are facing decisions. We need grace. We need understanding. We need the spirit of strong counsel to lead us into the ways of everlasting. When that spirit is upon you, you make wise choices. You make wise decisions. And you actually are in the right place at the right time. You see, destiny is a matter of being in the right place at the right time. And it's important that you don't miss your day of visitation. When Abraham, uh, Abraham was outside his tent door waiting for his day of visitation. When three men came, one of them was the pre-incarnate Christ with two angels that were about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But God visited Abraham before he sent judgment. Visitation precedes judgment. This is the model, the path of God's heart. God will always visit a church with revival and with visitation before judgment falls. He will warn, but he will visit with mercy. I'm telling you, God's not an angry dad. You're not catching him between mood swings, guys. He is constantly uh, full of love and mercy. One of his names is love. So this visitation, Abraham was waiting for it. He was in the right place at the right time. Uh, I know that's true, and I know God has steered me. He steered me to connect with a beautiful woman named Candace. He steered us when we decided what mission, uh, what field we were going to. We were going to New Guinea. We had our, you know, cards printed up. We were getting support, and uh, we were good moochinaries, and, and we were going to New Guinea, and uh, Papua New Guinea, absolutely. I would tell everybody, that's where we're going. Oh, yeah? 
spirit of strong guidance came upon me and we made a, a sharp, abrupt turn and ended up in Central and South America. The rest is history with our missionary career. But, but that spirit, that anointing has come upon your life. You don't even realize the times. You were at the right place at the right time for the blessing of God to come upon you. You're not going to miss your destiny when the spirit of wise counsel comes upon you. Now, one of the names of Jesus in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 is that he's wonderful counselor, isn't he? He's a wonderful counselor. The wisdom we need, the counsel, the guidance, the strength to make good decisions, it all comes from him. Now, I, you're getting a good cardio workout here, but I'm going to ask you to stand up again, and I want to release this. Of course, you could get it sitting down, but I want you to stand because I think it opens us. We stretch. We expand our heart. So just lift your, your open palm to heaven and, and say, give me your counsel. Give me the spirit of counsel that I would make wise choices, wise decisions, that I would be at the right place at the right time and come out smelling like a rose. When everybody else gave up on me, I have the spirit of wise counsel. And I'm going to re release it to others. And my words are going to bring life and counsel to others. Because the spirit of counsel is upon me. And it will never fail. As a never ending stream. Pouring out of me. The spirit of counsel from eternity. Number five. You're going to like this one. Everybody say, I'm going to like this one. Spirit of power. I told you, you'd like it. The spirit of power. The spirit of power. It's the word gibora. Gibora. Gibor, gibora. That Hebrew word is the word for mighty one. The mighty one. It's David's gibora. David's mighty man. It's the bold, brave, courageous anointing. It's a spirit that caused David to go up against a nine-foot terminator with nothing but a piece of leather, a pouch, and five stones. Spirit of bold, brave, warring, courage. Spirit of power. Now, the only thing you need to operate in this anointing is to step out. You don't have the spirit of power on the couch, folks. You don't have the spirit of power sitting on a little cushy little soft spot there. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'll just watch it online. No, you have the spirit of power when you need it. The anointing, it's a never-ending, it's a ceaseless flow. Uh, there's times this has come upon me, and I, it is so amazing. I, I, I had, it, it felt at times in the jungle that I had every demon in South America that was committed to kill us. It felt that way. I heard their voices outside our hut at night. Demons talking about how they're going to destroy us and our family. And there were times when it, the whole village turned against us. Told us, you ought to just go home like everybody else. You're so stupid, you'll never learn our language. Don't say that to me. I'm a competitive male. I tend to take those words as a challenge. Ended up translating the New Testament for them. But th this spirit of power when it comes on you, it reveals signs and wonders. It releases, it latches on to eternity and brings it into the meeting, brings it into the earth. Whether it's Elijah calling down fire on Carmel, or it's Jesus multiplying bread and fish, or it's walking on water or walking through walls. When the spirit of power comes upon you, there is absolutely no barrier, no limit, no wall, no ceiling. There is a limitless anointing that comes upon you. It is irresistible. No one can stand before you when that spirit of power comes upon you. You become a different person. Little tiny, petite, sweet little girls become mighty, brave Deborah warriors that embarrass the barracks and the males until they say, well, maybe I should follow this woman. Come on, ladies, women of God, rise up and, and, and silence all these critical know-it-alls that say women should never do those things. Oh, yeah? Make them look like idiots. I dare you, ladies. 
Come on, challenge this religious spirit that says women can't teach, women can't pastor, women can't prophesy, women can't. What is this women can't stuff? How come it's always the men saying that, by the way? Anyway, you got me on my high horse. The spirit of power. There's nobody that you're going to be afraid of. Tell me somebody what Paul said to Timothy. God has not given you the spirit of cowardly fear, but the spirit of power. You see, the spirit of power and love and a sound judgments, those anointings come from the sevenfold spirit of God. The spirit of power will make you successful where everybody else falls at your right hand and to your left. You end up on the battlefield. You're still standing. You may miss a few teeth, but you're going to still be standing there. And all your critics are going to be hiding and cringing in the dark. You ought to read Psalm 18 and you'll see what the spirit of power looks like. You ought to devour Psalm 18 and look at it where he says, I'm going to pulverize my enemies until they come cringing out of their caves. The spirit of power makes you bold. The Bible tells us that we come boldly to the throne of grace. You want to, you want to know what the Greek word really means there? Bold. We come boldly. We come boldly before the throne of grace. Can you imagine coming boldly before God and say, you, God, have to do this? You say, I'm not going to talk to God that way. Yeah, that's why you'll never see a miracle. Joshua spoke to the son. God moved and answered the, the words of a man. He says, all right, I like that. God's secure enough, he can handle you being bold to him. He likes it. He said, I like that. Tell me again. I said, God, you've got to send awakening to Connecticut. He says, okay. I will. You didn't hear me, God. You have to do it now, tonight, right here in this room. Okay. Right here to this people. Go with them in their car, with their home, into their house for the next three days. Burn on them with the spirit of power till they can't hardly take it anymore. They say, what's wrong with me? Nothing. Everything's becoming right with you. Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. The anointing is coming on you. What do you expect? What do you expect the spirit of power to look like? Oh, Lord, we ask you to come. I'm going to look in the beauty realm and just say, come, Lord. Oh, no, I'm telling you, that's all right. I'll be in that beauty realm with you. I'll pray those prayers with you. But there's a day and an hour when you rise up with tenacious faith that will not, will not, I will not relent until I have it all. You've been singing the wrong song. Turn it around. I won't relent until I have it all. Ask Jacob. He became a prince. There's a place for boldness in the kingdom of God. It's bold, violent men. And that word violent is the word for trembling and shaking. They're going to take the kingdom by what? Oh, that's scary. Isn't there something about binding the strong man? Isn't there something about dismantling the hierarchies of darkness? Put on the whole armor of God. Because when you do, you look like God on the battlefield. You get to wear God's clothes. Put on God's armor. You wear God's armor. It's the armor of God. It's what God wears when He faces every enemy. You get to wear God's wardrobe. He opens up the armoire and He says, You take my armor and stand against the enemy. That's the spirit of power. We, we wage war. We are a warring bride. Proverbs 31. We're the, yes, you could translate it virtuous. Go ahead and have your Mother's Day fun. But, but I'm telling you, there's more to this anointing of the last day's church. Bold, brave, dynamic, powerful, too hot to handle. Scare the daylights into you. Young people are going to rise up and break open the dawn and reveal a brand new day. Joel's army's coming. Fire in front, fire behind. You're not going to put that fire out. They're going to come and light fires wherever they go because the spirit of a mighty warrior. So I want you to stand up and say, the spirit of a mighty warrior is on me. The spirit of a mighty warrior is on me. The spirit of a mighty warrior is on me. 
the spirit of a mighty warrior is on me. Now, a few of you mean it. And you're going to get this anointing as you reveal and release this. Say it one more time. The spirit of a mighty warrior is upon me. I just saw an angel come into the room. I think it was you. I think the angel of the Lord came and stood right next to you. It's right in this, right in this area right here. You are going through a spiritual breakthrough. And I'm going to give you a victory that's going to connect you to me. I'm going to work so powerfully in your life that I'm going to silence every single tongue of strife. Those that have come against you, I will protect you, says the Lord. And those that have wandered from you, I will bring back because my name is Hero. I'm sending my mighty angel over you. Yes, you. Tiny one, petite one. What's your name? I'm telling you, you got the angel of the Lord all over you. Healing is in going. Are you, uh, is there an area of healing you need in your body right now? Is there something of healing? Okay, ministry of healing. You've asked God for healing because my left hand, just a fire coal. See my hand right there? See the color of my hand? Put your hand right there on mine. <laughs> there it is. Receive the healing anointing. The next person you put your hands upon, they're going to be healed. There's somebody you know and love that has a need of healing. God's going to use you to heal them. Say it one more time. The spirit of a mighty warrior is upon me. Before you sit down, tell that mean person next to you, that wild warrior next to you, tell them the spirit of a warrior is on you too. Okay. We won't, I won't keep you much longer, honestly. But let's go through these last two real quick. The sixth is the spirit of knowledge. This is, this is one of, that I really like. I, re, I like all of these. Mm, I love them all. But I really like the spirit of revelation knowledge. This has been a, a, something that I've cherished in my life. I want this anointing, and I, I want it to operate in my life and in the writing and in the translation and whatever I do, wherever I go. I want the spirit of revelation knowledge. Now, another way to translate this word, it is indeed knowledge or revelation knowledge, but as it goes into the Greek text, one of the ways you could translate this, the uh, epinosis, to experience the knowledge of God. And it's, it's the fullness of His knowledge. I like to put it this way. It's the spirit of discovery. The spirit of discovery. That you are not content to just listen to the boring dead doctrines of generations gone by. 300 old co year old commentaries are really good if you're 300 years old. But God has a proceeding now word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying right now. And in 2 Peter, 1 Peter, it says we, we have a more present truth. There, everything is true in the Bible, there, but there are some truths that are being revealed in new expressions. God wants you to operate in the spirit of revelation. This is where dreams, visions, trances, angelic encounters, throne room visitations, transportations being taken out of your body. Have I lost you yet? This is where these things come from. It's the spirit of revelation knowledge. When you have that, you know, uh, you know stuff. You know things. You can't tell everything that you know. You've had encounters. You've had dreams. You've had secrets. You'll see a person's face in prayer and they call you, uh, and your phone, you pick up your cell, and there they are calling you right then. And you speak to them the revelation knowledge. For many years in our church, when it was small, uh, I would have dreams. Every, every Saturday night, I would have dreams, and I would see the faces of every visitor in our church. Maybe that's why we, we grew and had so many visitors. But I got their face in a dream. And when they came in the door, I, I knew them in the spirit. I touched their spirit. And I called them out and prophesied to them the secrets of their heart. And they were wrecked and devastated. And some of them ended up becoming leaders in our church. And going out and doing their own ministry over time. 
But when this revelation knowledge is upon you, this is where prophecy flows. This is where revelation dreams. This is where the revelatory teaching comes from. And I'm telling you, the greatest gift of this coming awakening is going to be the spirit of revelation. Now, in every revival and awakening in days past, they always left us with another revelation, with a fresh revelation. Martin Luther, you know, every, every move of God, every reformation move of God brings to the church. It's like a wave that comes and deposits something, and as it goes back, it picks up something more, and it keeps coming over the generations and over the decades of time. And, and you know, whether it's the Father's love in, uh, in 1994 uh, uh, and uh, the evangelism and repentance in Pensacola in 1997, whenever that was, eight. And every move of God brings, let me tell you, this coming move of God. You want to know what truth it's bringing? All of them. It's not a truth. It's the Lord showed me the coming move of God, this coming greater awakening is going to bring the spirit of revelation, dreams, visions, a deluge of anointing, a deluge of prophetic revelation. Our children, our young kids, adults, people who have never operated in this realm, they're going to suddenly be invited in. This is the anointing coming upon imams. There are entire mosques in West Africa, entire mosques that are coming to Christ wholesale in, a, in like bam. And it's because of Esau visiting the iman and he gets up on the Friday prayers and leads the entire mosque. We're going to follow Esau. And they still pray and they still wear their clothes, but they're praying to Esau. You say, how can that be? It be. The spirit of revelation. Oh, I'm telling you. Can you imagine if you had the spirit of revelation, what that would mean? I have a friend. Uh, this is the truth. He, you know what he does? He goes to nations. God sends him as a prophet to nations. He's done this in Peru, South America. And he goes to the president of the nation and says, I can tell you where the gold is in your nation. And he walks out with the president in tow and brings the president of the nation out to a hill and says, right here is the gold mine you're to dig. And they are digging the gold and nations that have been in poverty and what we once called third world are now mining great resources because of a prophet that told him where to dig for gold. Is there any believers here in this house? His name's Johnny Enlow. I'll go ahead and give you his name. You can contact him and say, I had a guy tell me. Is he telling the truth? I'll let him tell you. Yes, it's the truth. It's happening. God has prophets, apostles that are operating in high levels of revelation, of anointing, that have been taken into the heavenly realm and been given the secrets and mysteries of what's coming and what God is to do, uh, what God wants us to do uh, on the earth. I'm telling you guys. Either we have a God of all power, all glory, who has all revelation, or we have a dead religious spirit that wants to tell us what God doesn't do anymore. I'm telling you, I left that up a long time ago when I came out of the closet and out of my evangelical limitations. Yeah, I'm one of those folks. Sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I want the spirit of revelation. It's getting tired, and, and the last one hasn't even come yet. But I want you to receive the spirit of revelation. When this comes upon your eyes, it will brighten your inner being. I can see people who have prophetic revelation. When I pray over them, I look into their eyes and I can see the spirit of revelation. How do I do that? By the spirit of revelation. Takes one to know one. And I see that. And I can tell the person, I say, you have had dreams and visions that you have never told people about because the Spirit of the Lord is now operating in a strong revelatory gift in your life. And then I give them the Word of the Lord. I can see it on their face. I like that. Would you like to have not a word of revelation, not just a cool little blog or one message that you bring that has a zing to it, but an actual anointing of revelation? And the thing about this anointing is it's very contagious. You know, here's a way I can prove.
prove to you the spirit of revelation is in the room. When you are hearing a teaching from Pastor Glenn or any, any person that's ministering in this anointing, and you suddenly get an idea and a thought that has nothing to do with the sermon you're listening to, and you write it down because the spirit of revelation is in the room, dropping little golden nuggets of glory and, and, and revelation upon you. So there's something about it that changes the atmosphere when the spirit of revelation. I'm telling you, there's coming to the church a new day of revelatory teachings because many will go here and there and revelation knowledge will increase. Daniel prophesied in the book of Daniel. Look at me real quick. He said many will go here and there, here and there. And revelation knowledge will increase. You see, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. You're the angel. The word angel in the Old Testament is the word um, uh, 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 similar to the New Testament Greek word. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce it. But I'm telling you that word in both Hebrew and Greek, this is fascinating. Many times the word angel in the Old Testament is not an angel with wings. It's an angel that drives uh, a Chevrolet. It's a human being. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Jacob saw heaven open. He saw a ladder going up, right? And he saw angels ascending and descending. If they ascended, that means they were on earth. If they were the angels of heaven, they would have descended and ascended. Jacob saw the ladder of angels, the last day's messengers are going to go up into the heavenly realm and be visited by God and receive the kingdom mandates, the kingdom expressions, the revelation of the Spirit, and come back. They're going to ascend and descend with fresh coals of fire for the body of Christ. Jesus repeated that dream to Nathaniel in the New Testament. He said the same thing. He said, you will see, Nathaniel, heaven open and the angels of God, the messengers of God, which are human the seven angels of the church in Revelation, they were the seven pastors or apostles of the churches. Paul said, you receive me as an angel. The word messenger, angel. So Jesus said, angels are going to ascend and descend. Would you like to go up and get your stuff to get your, your destiny, your mandates? I tell you, you'd have a fun weekend. You really would. You'd get up there and you go, whoa. Whoa. I need to change. I need to be, I need to think differently. Uh-huh. Yeah, you need to start putting on grace glasses and look in the eyes of revelation. Start praying the Ephesians 1 prayer, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the epinosis, the full knowledge, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And as we operate in this revelatory realm and the spirit of revelation is upon you, it, it's greater than any jewel, any, any money. I'm telling you, this is the currency of heaven. Your money on earth is powerful. It will buy. It will impact. You can build an orphanage. You can build a business. You can build a home. You can build a ministry. Money is very important in this world. However, it's worthless in the kingdom of God. Because in that realm, the true riches of heaven are the riches of revelation. Matthew 13, 11, I give to you the mysteries, the riches of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And he who has, more will be given. He who has what? Money. Sounds kind of capitalistic, doesn't it? No. He who has what? It's an ellipsis. Let's fill it in. He who has revelation, more will be given. You think you have, but you don't. God will take it and give it to the one that has it. Isn't that what happened in history? Those that thought they knew it all? They knew where the Messiah was going to appear, what it was going to look like, what he was going to do, overthrow Rome, come and do everything. But what they had has been taken. It's been given to us. Not to make us arrogant, but to make us thankful. Spirit of Revelation. I promise to get you out here in about 10 minutes. But before I do, I want to pray two more times. Spirit of Revelation. Would you stand, please, if you're able? I'm very, very, very confident that you're going to get this right now. Of all the things I've prayed over you, this one is going to fall, such as I have, I give unto thee. This anointing is going to be released upon you. So I want you to put your hands over your eyes, because the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, Paul said. When the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of your inner being will be enlightened, that you'll be washed in love, and you'll start seeing in the spirit 
like Jesus, like the prophets, like John. So, Lord, re release now the spirit of revelation and anointing to see the way you see. The eyes on the wheels of God, a wheel within a wheel with eyes spinning and twirling. Wings, wheels, eyes, and fire. The revelation of Ezekiel 1. The last day's church spinning forth in the glory of revelation light. Lord, we pray that if our eye be single, our whole body will be full of light. And we want our eye to be singly focused on the revelation of who you are. And our entire spirit body, our spirit man will be filled with light. Come and let the light shine. You are the light of the world. Jesus, you call us the light of the world. Help us not to be blind men leading blind men. We want light to see. Revelation eyes. Revelation light. Shine. Break loose. Break loose. No more gloom. A light has shined in a dark place. We shine as stars in the universe. Let light shine out of us. Let the light of revelation burn into our inner being and anoint us now with the living spirit of revelation light. In Jesus' name. Now this one is amazing. Number seven. And here's what's amazing about it. In Isaiah 11, which is our text, it says, is it verse 3? It says, He will delight. Jesus delights in this anointing. What I'm about to tell you is that of all the seven, this is the central shaft of the lampstand. And the other three, you can divide the other six into, into you know, triplets, three on each side. But this is that central shaft. This is the anointing Jesus most delighted in, and it's least delighted in, in the church today. He chose the wisest part, just like Solomon chose wisdom. Remember, God said, I'll give you anything. Solomon chose the right thing. God gave him everything. You see, if you choose the right thing, you get everything. That's God's luxurious way of giving. I'm going to say it again because I don't think you got it. If you choose the right thing, God gives you everything. Isn't that amazing? So this is the one to delight in. This is the one to choose. This is where you should start. Because when this anointing operates in your life, it empowers and anoints, if I could say it that way, the other anointings. You get a double portion when this anointing flows through your life. Something powerful. This is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. This is not the fear of the Lord. This is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. This is the anointing of awe and wonder before the living God. Now, it's, it's really fascinating some of the things I'm learning as I do the translation. And uh, I, I feel more drawn and more... Uh, uh, anyway, I just, I really like the Hebrew. I'll put it that way. The Greek is challenging somewhat to me as a translator, but I'm, I'm learning and growing as I go through this process. However, the Hebrew, the, the word for the fear of the Lord, the Hebrew word, the universe of meaning, if I were to draw out the universe of meaning for the word fear of the Lord, it is at least in three or four components. So you slice it in like a, uh, quadrangularly. So you put four components to this fear of the Lord. Unfortunately, in English, you get only one-fourth of that concept, fear of the Lord, which is fear of God. We fear God. But the problem in the New Covenant is that perfect love casts out fear. And God says, I have not given you the spirit of you see, fear is, the fear of God is not quite what you think it is. I'm not taking away that sense of dread or that sense of, of like heart stopping, uh, you know, uh, you're killing me, God. Uh, that is good. It's always good to be humble. Like the Lord told me one time, 
He said, Brian, you're fully qualified to be humble. <laughs> That's what he told me. I'm really qualified to be humble. Isn't that awesome? Mm. So it's good to repent. It's good to be humble before God. It's good to be broken. The bruised reed he does not break and the smoking flax he will not extinguish. And the broken, contrite heart is always precious in his eyes. He's drawn to the, to the brokenness of our hearts because he's a healer. He's a redeemer. There's a savior in, inside of him that says, I want to I heal this. I want to help you. I love you. I don't want to leave you that way. So we, we are drawn to that component of the fear and dread of God, and it is an accurate, valid component. However, the Hebrew word for fear of God is worship. It, it can also be translated worship. To fear the Lord is to worship Him. Those who feared the Lord, that is, those who worship Him. So there is a valid sense to carry it from Hebrew to English that when you translate the fear of the Lord, you at least need to footnote it that it can also mean the worship of God. Okay? So we have worship, we have dread, and the third component is the word of awe, to be in awe of God. It's like a mystery that is so alluring. You can stare at it. You can stare at this cosmos. You can stare at this God forever and ever and ever and ever and, and just barely get into the outer fringes. Like I like to say, the, the lint on the fringe of the hem of His garment. I'm going to cling to that. But there's something so awesome, so jaw-dropping, sock-dropping, stunning, breathtaking, like leave you stunned for, for years about God. He's not the tame, predictable, uh, just a little bit better than you entity. He is a, a massive mountain of glory. He is the, the most jaw-dropping, stunningly glorious, beautiful, majesty-filled being that, that genders constant, continual, ceaseless praise from the holiest beings of the universe. They are stunned in worship. They're, they're incapacitated as they even come near Him. He's that glorious. That is also a component of the fear of God, which does not mean I fear He's going to uh, kick me out. That's insecurity. That's torment. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. And fear has judgment attached to it. We fear the judgment and condemnation of God, but in Christ that condemnation has been removed. Please put that into your theological uh, heart. That we do not operate in guilt, fear, and condemnation. Those tools of ministry we abandoned years ago. We now flow in the spirit of life, love, and freedom, the effervescence of the spirit life that soars above, that is higher than, that transcends. So God wants to give right now to this church, and I'm going to leave with this, uh, this prayer and anointing. And every time that I've, I, I'm feeling it already, it, it's my, my jaw is getting hard to move. I'm feeling this anointing coming into the room. But I want to say a couple more things if he'll let me, if he, if he will let me. Whoa. But this is the revivalist awakening anointing. When this anointing, the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes upon you, you actually, you cause a ripple in the force field, Luke. You, you bring something so dramatic that, that extends beyond the confines of a building. It absolutely creates a radius of glory around you for miles and miles. If you were to read church history with the awakeners such as Charles Finney, Jonathan Edwards, Dwight Moody, David Brainerd, and uh, even in contemporary times with the great Timor Indonesian revival, which created some of the, where one of the, some of the most awesome miracles ever known on earth took place in Indonesia in the 60s. And you, you really become a student of the Evan Roberts, you know, the Welsh revival and, the, and even the Azusa Street revival. Do you know a story of the Azusa Street revival that, that many people don't know was, was uh, uh, um, the, the black preacher, Seymour, Daddy Seymour, that he, he put a box over his head. Did you know that the, the guy put a box over his head? You say what you will, but the dude would sit on the front row 
the bro would be on the front row, and he'd have a box over his head. Because he did not want any interference with the spirit and anointing of God. And, and he would sit there with the box on his head. And when he pulled the box off, the anointing of God would fall upon the room and people would fall on their face. And there's one historical account of when he, uh, was, he pulled the box off and the fire of God shout, shot out from him and went out for about three and four miles outside of the house on Bonnie Bray Street there in, uh, in L.A. And, and <laughs> it's like the anointing of God shot right out of that man and knocked people down and about a three-mile radius, <laughs> people were bowled over by a force of the anointing of God. Take that, multiply it times a hundred, and that's what's coming to Connecticut. That's what's coming. The epicenter of awakening is going to be a church just like this. Churches all along the shoreline from NYC to uh, Beantown, there's going to be all along the shoreline of Connecticut, there's going to be awakening outposts, especially where the rivers come forth. You're going to find the glory of God pouring out. Uh, my uh, church history, uh, revival history is not my field of, uh, of study, but I'm not uh, ignorant about it. And I have done a lot of research. It's just not my uh, specific field of study. I'm more linguist in other, other uh, sciences. But uh, as I study revival history, the accounts are breathtaking. And it all said, they all said the same thing, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And it would come out of people. You see, God wants to anoint you. This is what caused millions to follow Jesus. This is what even the, the apostles. You know Thomas? I don't know if you know your history about Thomas, the guy that we all think doubted real bad, you know? Do you realize of all the 12 apostles, he went further than any other apostle geographically? He carried Christ the furthest geographically than any of the 12. He was martyred on the... the, the Shore there in Chennai, India, uh, Madras used to be called, now Chennai, and they have a monument there where Thomas was speared through with multiple spears that finally ended his life as this doubting guy got touched by the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I'm telling you, when this anointing comes on you, you suddenly awaken a city, the city awakening, the city reaching anointing. You know, you go ahead and plot all you want about political takeover and who you're going to put in office and who we need to change and what we need to do politically. I'm telling you what will change America overnight. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. It's the steel punch of God that comes through. It, it is the dynamic dunamis that falls upon a people. It is what the Bible calls the breaker anointing. It goes forth with such power. It is relentless. It is irresistible. It, it, it cannot be contained. And in history, there were times when Finney, Charles Finney, in uh, Rochester, New York, was having revival meetings. And a 50-mile radius, I said 50-mile radius around him, was a zone of glory that it was next to impossible for you not to become a Christian when you stepped into that zone. And he would come into the city, New York. Uh, boat captains, sea captains coming with their ships miles out into the harbor, miles out to sea, would be converted before they even came to New York City. The awakening power of heaven was upon that man. It was as though eternity had funneled in to the anointing of that man, the anointing of the Spirit upon him, and he became an awakener. People would get in trains from New York, from uh, the stations of New York. They would go in trains to upstate. And as they would get in the train, they would ask the conductor, how do we know where Finney is having his meetings? Where, will we, where, where are the meetings? How will we know where to find it? And the conductor would laugh and say, you'll have no problem. You'll feel it when you get off the, the train. When you get near Rochester, you will feel it. Just go where the crowds are going. You will be taken. And this tractor beam from heaven pulled on the hearts of men. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. Tears, weeping, the brokenness of sinners begging God 
to lift the guilt of sin. Pretending Christians that said they were believers but were nothing but phonies. They were the first ones to come like an avalanche into the kingdom of God. Billy Graham was once asked what would happen when that anointing came back to America. He said the church would get saved. And we'd start to have real Christians and believers. When the spirit of the fear of the Lord comes upon you, of course you're not going to go out and like, what, smoke a cigarette? I don't know what your favorite naughty, naughty, naughty sin may be. Of course you're not going to want to do that. It's not that suddenly this legalistic oppression comes on everybody. No, it's that you can't breathe because holiness is so strong and tangible. You feel like, like every thought of your mind, soul, and being must be toward God. You know that the pews, they had pews back in those days. Wooden pews, hard ones. Oh, baby. Ah, aren't you glad you're on soft chairs since I'm keeping you so late? But in these pews, that when the spirit of revival, the spirit of the fear of the Lord would come upon the meeting, that they were actual prints of the people's fingers embedded like claw marks into the wooden pews so, so that they would not fall into hell. People would have open visions of heaven and hell, mostly hell, especially when Finney preached. He had repentathons, man. I'm telling you, that guy. He would have everybody write out all of their sins. He said, don't come back tomorrow unless you write out all your sins. Now bring me that list. They would come because of the fear of the Lord. They would come. He'd take the paper and say, you left out half of them. Go back and do it again. I mean, he was, the guy was like, if you've ever seen his picture, I'll put it up on my Facebook just to scare you. I did one day. I put his picture one day as my photo on Facebook. You wouldn't believe some of the stuff I got on there. And they all said, oh, but God's not like that anymore. Oh, yeah? I don't know what kind of God you know, but I'm let, let's see what you're going to say when he comes for you. What you're going to do when he comes for you? What you're going to do? Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Is there anyone in this room that wants to be an awakener? Don't, 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 don't just say anything. Don't, I want you to think about this. What this really means. Everything you are, everything you have gets thrown into the fire. Everything. The flame of God until you become a consuming living flame. Folks, this is not... Desperate times require, demand desperate measures. And our nation is sick. Our nation is desperate. And it's far beyond politics. Now we're talking about deception in the hearts of men and women. We're talking about issues that only God can heal. We're talking about things that man has no answers for. And as desperation begins to grip our nation again, we are going to cry as never before for the living God. And I'm telling you, a true awakening is coming to America. And it's coming to Connecticut. And it's coming to harvest time. And you've had... A very kind God nudge you gently. <sighs> Mother's Day a year or so ago, <sighs> sent the coal of fire, knocked your pastor on the ground under the piano for how long, and the revival glory began to burn a little bit because he loves this church and he's easing us in. But I'm telling you, that was the river. This is the sea. What's coming is so massive. So incredible, every one of us are going to get saved again. We're going to be born again, again. We're going to come to Jesus. We're going to have a come to Jesus meeting. And we're going to get our hearts right with God and each other. We're going to love each other. We're going to care about one another instead of our own selfish cocoon that we live in. Where the soap opera in our head, the drama, the constant drama of our own lives. Suddenly we open up and we realize I am a fountain of blessing for a people that are near me. I am a cup overflowing. I am a dispenser of glory. I am an awakener. I am a fire starter. I operate and flow with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. When I come into the room, people are going to talk different. Not because I'm mean, but because the spirit of God comes upon them. 
And when we move into the community, when we move on the earth, God's going to move with us. When we move to the left, He's going to move to the left. It's, what, what's that? Is something like that? That one, yeah. He moves to the left and we go, ah, I'm out of here. There's a whole lot of Holy Ghost in the room right now. I'm telling you. Oh, my. On this Shabbat, Lord, we ask this beautiful August evening with these lovely people that I cherish. I ask for the spirit of the fear of the Lord. That we would be changed, transformed, unable to go on the same way with our negative thinking, our self-absorbed lives, our unrepentant flirting with sin, but we would become the clean, squeaky clean vessels that you can fill over and over, that you can pour out of us until a city is awakened. Make me an awakener. I want to see the billion soul harvest of the great awakening. I want to see campuses converted. I want to see cities brought to Christ. I want to see a generation rise that's no longer wise in their own eyes. It's no longer full of pride and arrogance, but are hungry and desperate. Let the daybreakers come forth. Let the dawn makers arise. Let Joel's army sweep down from the mountain of glory. Jesus, as you delighted in this anointing, I ask that you would make our delight in this spirit of the fear of the Lord. Come, Lord. Set our hearts on fire. Set our hearts on fire, Lord, till we burn with holy passion. Give us the fear of the Lord. That silences the lying voices of deceivers. That overwhelms every hindrance. Like a river that overflows that cannot be contained. Like a flood like a massive flood, uncontainable, indescribable, unlimited anointing. Of the fear of the Lord. I have prayed over you seven times, and I now release over you now. The fear of the Lord. Welcome that anointing. Receive it. Receive it inside. Welcome that anointing. Lovers of God will walk in the fear of the Lord. The most fervent, fiery lovers will carry this anointing. It will awaken a city. It will shift a nation. All we need is one, two, three, maybe 12. We don't need to fill a stadium. We need to fill our heart with the fear of God. Just one. Are you the one? 
Are you the hungry one that came this weekend to receive? Let eternity come into the room right now. Strip away time, limitations, the earthly. Bring the fear of the Lord. Baptize us. This is the baptism of fire. It is the baptism of the fear of the Lord. More. Stop looking at yourself. It's not who you are. Look away unto Jesus. Any bush can burn with fire. Any bush will do for God. Make us a burning bush. Set us on fire. Set us on fire. Wow. Oh, Jesus. It's like drops of fire. It's like rain that burns. It's, it's a flame like dew. <laughs> it's falling right now. Some of your faces are starting to glisten in the anointing of the Spirit. <laughs> Light us on fire. Light us on fire. More, Lord. More of your presence. This is Jesus. 
He is the fear of the Lord. His presence brings us there. for more fullness God all seven anointings It's an atmosphere of the presence right now. It's an atmosphere. It's like you're on the top of Kilimanjaro or something. Top of a high mountain. You've ascended the hill of the Lord. The highway of holiness. This is the highway of holiness. The secret stairway of the sky. Consuming fire, fanning me to flame. The passion for your name, Spirit of God, that you fall in this place. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way. Consuming fire, fan into 